as we celebrate the Reformation today. How fortunate we are that God's ancient word is still a living and active word, still able to change hearts and lives. We celebrate that again today. The text on which I base my message to you this Reformation Sunday is found in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. We're going to read verses 15 through 21 of chapter 5. Paul writes, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. On October 31st in the year 1517, Luther posted 95 theses on the door of the Wittenberg Chapel. Thus started the Protestant Reformation. Those theses were points of doctrine that he wanted to discuss with the church, points of debate that he had with some of the teaching in his day, teaching that unsettled him, teaching that as he rediscovered the gospel, he began to realize this teaching was not indeed biblical and not correct. Now we speak about the Protestant Reformation, but Reformation may not be the most accurate word to describe what began as a result of Luther's actions on that October day. Regeneration or revival might be better ones. Organizationally, the church reformed, but spiritually, it really came to life. As the gospel was recovered and placed again at the center of the teaching of the church, spiritual life began for multitudes of people. That new birth must need or lead to new living. Being a Christian is not just a head thing or a heart thing, it's a, a life thing. The theme of the passage that we're looking at this morning could appropriately be entitled The Exercise of Christian Wisdom. And I say that because of what Paul writes in verse 15 of our text. He says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. So as a result, I've entitled my message this morning, Living Wisely. So what is wisdom as we speak about living wisely? Maybe we need to be on the same page as to what wisdom really is. I think scripture teaches that wisdom is that ability to apply knowledge correctly to the practical situations of life. It's knowledge that can be put to use, that is very practical in nature. Some might call wisdom in a biblical sense common sense, but it's even more than that. It's appropriate for the situation. Unlike a young man who graduated from seminary, he took a call to a small town church. Shortly after arriving, he was asked by the local undertaker to hold a graveside service for a man who had died homeless and with no known family in the area. The young pastor said of course he would. He was informed that the funeral was going to be held at a new cemetery way out in the country. In fact, this man's remains would be the first laid to rest in that new cemetery. Now the young preacher wasn't yet familiar with the area and he became lost. Being a real man, he didn't ask for directions. Go. Oh. <laughs> Finally, he found the cemetery, but he was about an hour late. The hearse was nowhere to be found. What he saw was a backhoe and an open hole with uh, dirt around it, and he found a grounds crew that was sitting nearby, and they were actually eating their lunch. Well, the minister apologized to the workers for being late, and then he went and made his way to the grave. Looking into that open pit, he saw what he thought was a burial vault with its lid already in place. So he went back to the crew and he asked their indulgence. He, he promised that he wouldn't keep the workers long, but it just it was the right thing to do to say some words. 
So the workers put down their sandwiches and they followed him over to the open hole and stood around as he began to preach. That preacher poured out his heart for that unknown man. He had very enthusiastic preaching. And some of the workers must have caught some of that enthusiasm because they began to encourage him with remarks like, Praise the Lord or Amen. Well, that just spurred the preacher on all the more, and he preached and preached and preached. When the service was over, he said a prayer, and then began to walk back to his car. As he got to the door, or of the, to the car and, and began to open the door, he overheard one of the workers say to another one, you know, that's one of the most remarkable things I've ever seen. And I've been installing septic systems for over 20 years. Theologically, he may have been right on, but he wasn't real wise in not checking, was he? <laughs> We're to be living wisely. In fact, Paul tells us that we need to exercise great care in our daily walk with him. We need to do this because the stakes are high. In fact, earlier on in the fifth chapter, beginning at verse 3, Paul says, But among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper in God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse jesting, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So live as children of light. There is a present danger, a danger present, and it is a danger that presents us eternal consequences. What he is warning about here is the fact that we could literally lose out on an eternal inheritance in the kingdom of God, that even having known and embraced the truth by faith, faith we could fall back under God's wrath, having moved away from the truth by ourselves, and once we do, we can also then fall away from the grace of God. We need to be careful how we live because Paul says the days are evil. Does anybody here have any difficulty seeing the days as evil in the age in which we live? I mean, duh, right? <laughs> That's about as obvious as obvious can get. The days are evil. And so we need to be careful how we live. Not as unwise, but as wise. He tells us in verse 16 that we need to make the most of every opportunity. Now that word translated opportunity is a good translation from the original language. There are three words that can be translated time, or uh, one of them is hora, which means hour, or literally the time that you'd see or observe on a watch. Then there's chronos, from which we get chronological, and that also would refer to a measured period of time. The final word is the word kairos. That's the one that is used here. And kairos makes reference to an open window of opportunity which is limited. And this time or this opportunity won't last forever. So there is and there should be a sense of urgency about taking advantage of that opportunity when it's presented, of going through the window when it's open. And it's all about an attitude, isn't it? We need to redeem the time. We need to make the most of every opportunity. And we, can, we can look at that from two opposite point of, points of view. It's kind of like the, the two shoe salesmen who were sent into a, an underdeveloped country, but they were seeking to expand and to open a new market there. Well, after a short time, the first one communicated with the home office, and he said, bring me home. No one here wears shoes. A couple days later, the second salesman sent in a huge order, excitedly exclaiming, fill this order as quickly as you can. No one wears shoes here. Same situation, totally different outlooks. 
One very negative, dead end, and the other very positive. We need to approach it from the positive point of view. God's in control. And we need to take advantage then of every opportunity that arises for us. And wisdom is that which will help us to recognize the opportunities which come our way. And then it will also encourage or motivate us as to how we can effectively take advantage of them. Paul literally says that we should be redeeming the time, buying it back, putting it to use. For instance, two of the three men that were entrusted with a, a sum of money in the parable of the talents looked at it as an opportunity. They took some chances. They invested the funds that had been entrusted to them and had good returns on their money so that when the owner came back and checked them out on their stewardship, they were able to say, look, we doubled your investment. But the third one, remember him? He was afraid of failure. And so rather than taking any uh, chances with, with that money, he went and dug a hole and buried it in the ground so that when the master came back, all he had to do was dig it back up and say, hey, look, I didn't lose anything. Here's everything you gave me. He was the one who was punished because he didn't redeem the time. He didn't take advantage of the opportunity same phrase is used in Colossians 4 verse 5 where it says be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of what you have. You know the old saying, you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. That's true, isn't it? It really is. So as we see opportunities to reach out, to get to know, to show the love of Christ to neighbors and those around us, we need to redeem the time. We need to take advantage of those opportunities. To do so is to live wisely. Jesus warns in John 10, verse 10, the thief comes in to steal and kill and destroy. He says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And you and I, you and I have the privilege of redeeming the time, of investing ourselves, of sharing the word of God with others that they too can be benefited and experience that fullness of life that can come only through a personal relationship with Jesus. Secondly, we're admonished in this text, don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. To be foolish is not to have or not to exercise sound judgment. It would be the opposite of wisdom. Foolishness is unwise, if you will. So what is the Lord's will? Well, in a general sense, we're told in 1 Timothy 2, at verse 4, that God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. He wants salvation for everyone. And so we have a part in that, having been commissioned, and so we need to take that word to others. But that's part of the will of God, that we share that word with others so that they too to have faith kindled in their hearts and begin to walk in relationship with the Lord. Secondly, then, God's will is also for our sanctification or for our spiritual growth. In 1 Thessalonians 4, the first half of that verse, it says, it is God's will that you should be sanctified. He wants us growing in a relationship with Him, growing in our faith, growing to be able to live more wisely and less foolishly than we will. And even if our discipleship should bring us into suffering or difficulty, we are continue, or we are encouraged, excuse me, in God's word to continue to follow the example of Jesus. We're told that in 1 Peter 2.21. Because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in your steps. So even if those steps we take following Christ would bring us into difficulty, we are to continue to take them and to be reminded and encouraged that He has gone that way before. He knows the way through and He'll never leave us or forsake us. Now specifically, we seek to ascertain the will of God on a daily basis, first and foremost by going to His Word. The Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Through it, He would give us specific teachings. 
and at times he would give us biblical principles which we would be able to take into specific situations and employ them for our benefit and for his glory. Secondly, we ascertain the will of God by prayer, by bowing before him and by seeking his help, the help of his Holy Spirit who would open the word of God to us and help us to recognize our situation. And finally, we are to seek out the counsel of wise Christians. And I'm not speaking about just yes, but those who would give us the advice to go the way that we really got in our hearts. I mean, it would kind of be like asking my wife or asking which boss, should I go fishing? I'll always ask which before my wife. <laughs> but on the more important matters, we need to go to those people whose wisdom is evident to us, those people who will care for us and take seriously our requests and commit themselves to prayer, who would have the opportunity then to share things that they've learned as they've studied the Word of God and applied it to their own lives. We need to seek the counsel of wise Christians. And then as we would make specific decisions, we should ask questions like, would it be sin to go this direction? Would I violate any known principles of God's word by taking such a course of action? Would I have to compromise any core convictions to go in this direction or that? And would it glorify God? Those, those are questions we should ask. That's the desire that we ought to have, is that we might glorify Him, seek His will, and not our own great Reformation principles of sola scriptura, or the word alone, and the universal of priesthoods get applied then as we would go to his word, as we would seek his will in prayer, and as we would seek the counsel of wise Christians. Thirdly, we are admonished in this text, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. There's a sharp contrast here between being drunk with wine or filled with the Spirit. When we speak of somebody who's drunk, we talk often about them being under the influence, don't we? They're under the influence of alcohol. They're not thinking clearly. And the contrast then is, as we are filled with the Spirit, we come under His influence. See, it's all right to be under the influence. It just depends on what or who that, in, that influence is. We are to be filled with the Spirit under His influence. Drunkenness leads to debauchery or moral corruption or dissipation, wastefulness, wasting opportunities, wasting the times before us, squandering something of value like the prodigal son who got his inheritance early and then went out and squandered it in wild living. But to be filled with the Holy Spirit is to be under His control. One of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. And Paul, as he writes to Timothy or to Titus in chapter 2 of that epistle, at verse 11 says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed, and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous. Do you have that kind of zeal? A zeal to be that which is right, zeal to honor him in your daily life. When it says that we are to be filled with the Spirit here, that's in the present tense, so it should be an ongoing thing. It's in the passive voice, which means we don't do the filling, but God himself will do it through word and sacrament. And it's in the, the imperative mood, which means it's not to be an option for us. We are called to open ourselves to God and to allow him to fill us with the presence and person of his Holy Spirit and then allow him the ministry through the word and the sacraments of opening our hearts and our minds so that we might indeed let the word of God 
wellness, which is also part of the full life that Jesus promises, his abiding presence, his guidance, his protection, and his love. Now, there's also an emphasis on worship and on fellowship in the remaining verses of our text. He says, speak for one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. The psalms are spiritual or scripture songs. Hymns are uninspired poetical compositions praise God. They're of a more objective nature. They look at God and focus on Him and His person and His greatness. And spiritual songs would be songs of testimony, songs through which we would express our own personal spiritual experience. And all of these, all of these are useful for us. And for our benefit, spiritually speaking. And when He speaks about being submitted to one another, it means that none of us tries to rule it a military term which literally means to get in rank and fire. And it applies to both leaders and subordinates alike. It consists of a proper assessment of oneself in relation to others. Paul in Romans 12 verse 3 says, For by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Philippians 2, verses 3 through 5. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. We use love for the love of God put into practice in our daily lives. And Paul in Romans 12, verse 10 says, be devoted to one another, brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. We have a high standard aim for one another. And yet it is so important, it's so beneficial, and life in the church and the family of God can be so much better than we even know it now if we would continue to submit ourselves to one another and to truly desire to honor each other, to be devoted to one another good times and hard times, through successes and failures. We who belong to Christ must continue to take his word seriously. First of all, we need to apply it to ourselves. We must also continue to spread his word to the world around us. And all of this then must be in submission to the leading and empowering of the Holy Spirit. We who are Christ's should reflect his likeness to the world around us, by the, to the world around us by the lives we live. And only then will the reformation continue. And only then are we truly in the will of God and living in God's name. So be very careful then how you do it. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father, for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence. This 